Ready? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning uh, Bible study at the Center Beach Bible Church. Um, we're going to uh, read a reading from Romans chapter 12, verse 1, which says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. Uh, we thank you for scriptures like these, Lord, that uh, uh, sometimes, Father, even though you say they're our reasonable service, we don't even want to do them. And uh, they are reasonable to do, and sometimes just so hard. So we pray, Father, that you would bring light to the darkness in this area. Uh, when we feel like we don't know what to do in life, we have no direction, and we keep complaining, Lord, I don't know what to do, you keep saying, do this. And in fact, I think we'll call this study, do this when you don't know what to do. I pray that the Holy Spirit would take over and give us wisdom and direction as we go forth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mother, could you give me some coffee? Thank you. Regular coffee. You know what? They say I need a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. And I uh, could use a little bit of coffee this morning. Didn't sleep uh, well last night. And, uh, and, I, and I asked for your... Uh, grace as I really didn't I wasn't we didn't have anybody so this is a last minute fill in to teach this morning so uh, I pulled from my uh, files uh, a study that I started in September 2023 um, and we ran out of time and we never completed it so let's let's see where it takes us this morning but uh, as I as I said before uh, we all say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do in life. I don't know what to do in church. I don't know what to do with my family. I don't know what to do. Well, God says, do this. Uh, because, you know, we, we all have the same desires. We all desire purpose. We all desire meaning in life. Uh, we all desire a reason to get up in the morning. And the more I talk to people, uh, the less people... Uh, I find want to get up in the morning. Uh, that alarm goes off. I know, you know, some alarms are just horrible. I remember when I was had my a real job. I used to have that alarm that went. <laughs> it was like the worst thing. You wake up in the morning, you knew it was like going to be a bad day. It's like got to be something better than that alarm. It was just horrible. It was brutal, you know. Uh, so. Sometimes, you know what, mornings uh, are the hardest time. Uh, I know for me, I don't like the mornings. Uh, but I do like the mornings when I get up extra, extra early. There's something about getting up like three or four o'clock in the morning and having to do something. I don't know, I like that. But uh, for the most part, I think most of us don't like the mornings because we know it's a day that's filled with things that we don't know what they're gonna be. Uh, uncertainties, uh, you know, expectations that we are not prepared to meet. Uh, so I believe this is a scripture written by Paul that really, it really says it, and whether we like it or not, it's up to us. And so many things with the Word of God, uh, it's really amazing. Oh, here, here comes my... Here comes my clarity filter in my mind. It's like I, my fuel filter is clogged and uh, I need to put some gum out, uh, fuel filter cleaner in it here to get this going. So just bear with me. I just finished reading the book uh, somebody from church gave me uh, that really blew my mind. Uh, like all these things, if you wanna destroy your church, do all these things. Wow. It's like 12 steps of how to destroy your church, and it was really, really good. And uh, felt like the person was uh, in my head. 
because I, I believe through it, it all. And one thing this pastor said, uh, who actually gave up, he pastored the church for 20 years. He's called the failed pastor. And uh, you can follow him on, on Twitter or X. And I've been following the guy. But uh, one of the things he kept saying is that the reason why we have so many problems is really simple. We don't do what the Bible says. If we really actually did everything the Bible said, first of all, your church would leave. And that's what he started to do. He started to preach verse by verse exactly what the Bible says, even the stuff that makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. and you know what it did? It emptied out his church until he was left with nine people. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because in reality, we don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. We don't. And he said, you know, like I've been saying, is that most people in the churches are not even saved. They're not believers. They're not even the pastors are. Because if, if we were, these things would not offend us. They would inspire us. But people say, well, I don't like that. I'm out of here. He goes, you, you, you can't study through the Bible, get to a portion and go, on, oh, I can't read that today. That's going to fit, and that's going to insult Bob, Mary, Pete. He's not going to like that. Jane's not going to like that. So you start skipping scriptures because you look at your church and you say, well, that's going to offend that person. That's going to offend that one. And we just skip it. And he goes, after a while, you might you find yourself just reading like three scriptures because that's all that anyone really likes. But the Bible is what it is. And like this morning... God gives us some things, you know, and isn't not like, hey guys, if you feel like it, nice suggestion, you know, maybe, you know, change your oil every 3,000, 4,000. Now, these are not suggestions. This is God's commands, okay? This is God says, do this. Mm -hmm. And we say, no, I don't think I will. God says, okay, move on. And... It's, it's kind of funny reading that book by that pastor, uh, uh, How to Destroy Your Church in 12 Easy Steps, uh, <laughs> is that's the mentality of most people, you know? And, and, that's, and, and his mentality is kind of, uh, it's kind of got on me like a stink because he ended up being such a, a, he was so frustrated towards the end of his 20, I think 21 years of pastoring. His grandfather was a pastor, his father was a pastor, and he became a pastor. And he goes, you know, it was, it was great, it was wonderful, but it was the worst thing I ever went through in my whole life. I'll never do it again. Why? Because the people are just horrible. And the people don't want to really hear what the Bible says. They really don't. Okay? If every pastor in the United States actually opened the Bible and started to read everything, and even says Revelation... Because if they started to read everything, most of the church would leave. Mm -hmm. What does that say? We don't want to hear what God has to say. We want to hear what we want God to say to us. And in order for churches to survive, pastors have decided to filter out all the uncomfortable things about what God says. And he goes, you can't do it. But he goes, he said, he goes, I'm a living experiment. I decided, you know what? I am going to preach every single thing the Bible teaches. And, and I knew every Sunday he goes, they're leaving, they're leaving, and they're leaving. Okay? And he knew. Mm -hmm. And he kept on pushing through. And he goes, I'm just going to keep going with the word of God, word of God. He goes, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what these people think. It matters did I do what God wanted me to do? And he goes, well, into so many pastors today who are more concerned about standing in front of their people than standing in front of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, and I tell you, the book really blew, I, I mean, it's one of those books, I couldn't put it down, I read it like in three days, blew my mind, and I'm like, yes! It gave me so many answers because I thought I was losing my mind, but he's right on the money. He's right on the money, and he didn't, you know, go for any of the new fangled ways to get people. I'm not doing it. I'm doing it like the apostles did it. I'm doing it like the prophets did it. I'm doing it like Jesus did it. I'm just going to read the word, keep the entertainment down to a minimum, and just preach. 
everything. The full canon of God. And let's see what happens. Okay? People just left. They just left. So, with that all said, uh, I'm, I'm going to read where we, uh, up to where we left off and start. So, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, Paul speaking to the Christians in Rome. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So, you know, Paul is talking to Christians. Whenever you see the term brethren, he's talking to other believers. So, this is directed... Was that? Uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And, and Paul is a big guy on beseeching. I think I'm going to start all my conversations now with beseeching. <laughs> I, 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 I think we should all start that. When, I, you know, remember like in Seinfeld when they started to cut the candy with the thing? We should start a new thing. Uh, I beseech you, a uh, person at 7-Eleven, I would like one of those and one of those. Okay? Because... Beseech means I, in the strongest language possible, implore you, whatever, please listen to this, okay? And it, you know, going back to the book, I'm probably going to keep referring to the book. He said, in, in everything, every situation that I dealt with, people with marriage problems, okay? He goes, I stopped counseling them. I said, you got a problem with your husband, problem with your wife? This is what scripture says. Let's read it. Yeah, I know, but but then I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. This is what it says. Do it. But I don't want to hear it. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. And I tell you, they left. Mm -hmm. And they would go to a place that would finally say that you're right. Mm -hmm. Everything you're doing. And we go to churches that justify our sins and our desires and our passions. And to make us believe that we are right because we don't want to hear what the Bible says. I think the coffee's kicking in. Okay? Okay. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, what does that mean? Okay? Well, a living sacrifice is different than a dead sacrifice. <laughs> So if we're alive, then what are we to do with who we are? Offer it as a sacrifice to God. What does sacrifice mean? It means taking something that would be good to me and not giving it to me. Actually giving it to someone else. Living a life that is wholly God-centric, me, no-centric. Okay? It's, it's just... A life of pure humility and servanthood. Because what did Jesus say? Those who want to be chief in the kingdom are servant of all. Jesus came as a servant. Mm -hmm. And you want to be a believer who pleases God? Serve others. You know, I, and I go over these things over and over again. And then God confirms it by interactions with people. And I was talking to somebody. <clears throat> and telling me about their life, their problems, and went on and on and on and on. And one of those conversations you can't like, mm -hmm. I'm going to quote Seinfeld all morning here, that you, you can't get a little break of space to get, but, 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 you just can't get in there. So you just sit there. I've actually, this is, I, I know this is a horrible thing. I've actually, when I've been doing phone counseling, I have, you know, I speak a phone, we do, I do counseling all over the country. When those people, I'll walk away, I'm working over here, come back, they're still talking. Yeah. They don't even know I'm gone. Yeah. You know people like that? Yeah. yeah. And after I was done with this person, I, 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 I take notes, and, and I write down, and it was done, and I said, you know, Lord, if I told that person the truth, it's kind of strange because what you do when you counsel people and like when we live with people, we, we all know of people, we appease people. We say what we don't, what they, what they don't want to hear. Well, we, we say what they do want to hear because you know what? You go, my, you know, you go, my life is so, I'm so tired. I'm so stressed. I don't have it in me to get into it with this person, and I know the fallout. So with this one particular person, I made a list of like seven things. 
that they're doing wrong in their life. Scripturally, it got scriptures. And I thought, and I said, you know, God, if I was to call them and say, listen, I got an answer to your problem. Mm -hmm. They're very upset. And here are seven things that you're doing wrong and why you're wrong. And you're your own worst enemy. And I said, you know what? If I tell them that, they will hate me. And they will never talk to me again. Mm -hmm. And we'd be very offended. And isn't it sad that's what we do. I tell you, I'm going to be doing that less and less. I tell you, be ready for offenses because you have to get to the point where you are either more concerned what God thinks about your life and what you're doing, or you're more concerned about what people think. I, I think Paul said it in the book of Galatians. Do I now seek to please men? Or do I now seek to please God? If I seek to please men, I cannot be the servant of Christ. And boy, yes. Um, just an observation. So there's a verse in Proverbs 29.5. So New Living Translation, it reads, to flatter friends or lays a trap, something like that. Yeah. Sure. And I use that all the time when, I, when I'm talking to people and I say, I have to say what's true or else I'm setting them up. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, and, and you are, and you know, use a term of the world, blowing smoke up their nose, okay? Uh, that's what you do, because they want to hear these things. And then how many times, and I have this, you know, revelation as I sit back and I go, God, how many years have I been counseling people? How many years have I just said, you know what, if I really say what really needs to be said, I don't have the fortitude to deal with all the anguish I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. So you just, what do you do? You just, appease, yeah. you just appease. And you know what? I'm in sin. I'm a disgrace. I'm the one who's failing God. And these people's lives who are not being turned around, you know why? Because everyone's afraid to tell them what they need. Because if they vomited on me mm -hmm. all their issues, they vomited on a million other people. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they never stopped with their problem mm -hmm. is because no one has the courage to say, stop it. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that everything you're doing is wrong. <laughs> and in this particular case, and, and I could share with this person, you are to offer yourself, oh, I want to be a Christian, well then be a living sacrifice. Yeah. Don't walk this earth like we see today, just thinking that everyone owes you everything, everyone has offended you, everyone should be capitulating to all your needs and desires and better be nice to you. Well, they weren't very nice to Jesus Christ. Yet Jesus loved them. Okay? And if you want to have people in your life, so many people, not all, but so many people, who are the loneliest, sometimes they're lonely because of themselves. Okay? And like I said, not in every case, but in so many cases, and I've shared this before, you know, people who will come to me, bears but I got no friends, I got no one to hang out with, I got in this, I don't got that. And and I and I use this example all the time of one, one particular person who's not here anymore, but they would always say, I got no friends. No one wants to be my friend. And, and, and I knew, and I like doing these little social experiments. So I say, you know what? The Bible says, in order to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. So this is what I suggest you do. There's a lot of people in church that of your gender, because I, 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 I like men to stick with men, women with women when it comes to friendships. There's plenty of people. Ask one of them out to the diner for coffee. And... Be a friend, okay? Go out and take the initiative. So, I says, okay, I will. Come back a couple weeks later. Yes, I need to report. Come on, tell me what happened. Well, it didn't work. I said, why, what happened? Well, I sat there, and by the time I was done, all he did was talk about him. He didn't want to hear anything about me. And I was like, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Why does no one want to hang out with you? Because you didn't go there to serve them. You went there 
to trick them into serving you and letting them listen. Because what did you want? Them to be quiet and say, tell me about you. You know what the best friend is? The one who says very little about themselves mm -hmm. and says, hey, tell me about you. Mm -hmm. I want to know everything about you. You want to make a friend, it's not about what you get out of the deal. It's what that person gets out, and hopefully they get a little bit of Jesus out of you. So that person walked away. Well, that person only cared about them. No, you only cared about you, and you don't even see it, and you will be alone for the rest of your life because everyone has done them wrong. That's a strong thing, but so many people live in their own private Idaho. Who, what was that song? Who was that band uh, did that song? Maybe it was uh, Frank Zappa. Uh, I don't know. Did that song. Living in your own private Idaho where everyone has done you wrong. Well, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren. We're not going to get far on this one. We're never going to finish this study because we're just on this first verse. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And what does it mean to present? Take who I am and lay it down for God. In what way? Well, it should be holy. Okay, this is interesting. <clears throat> and boy, am I learning it so much. This is after this book that I read, the pastor said, uh, so many of us Christians, biggest, one of our bigger problems is we're just not holy. Yeah. We're just not holy. Why? It goes back to what he said. Because we don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. Holy living is mandatory. Well, it's too hard. I don't have it in me, and you don't understand. No, God says right here, be holy. Be, what does Jesus say? Be ye holy. Why? For I am holy. If it was impossible, God wouldn't have said it. He would be lying. He would be telling us to do something. If God says, if you want to be a Christian, then you should be able to jump off the roof of your house and live. Well, then we better be able to jump off the roof of our house and live, if that's what God says. If God says, be ye holy, for I am holy, it doesn't mean perfection, no sin, but boy, you better be making holiness, not happiness. Oh boy, this is another thing. I'm going to go off on a tangent here. People, what's your goal? Holiness or happiness? Know what the Bible says our goal should be? Holy. Is there anywhere in the Bible where it says our goal should be happiness? No. How do we know? Jesus' goal wasn't happiness. It was holiness. Fulfilling the Father's will. But I'll tell you this. If you live your life unto holiness you will be happy because God will bless you in your holiness. So right here, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, look at the next part, acceptable unto CNN, no. Acceptable unto your coworkers, no. Acceptable unto your neighbors, no. Acceptable unto your husband, your wife, your family, your mother. No. Who are we to live acceptable to? God. And that's our problem because we don't care if we look right and we are proper in the eyes of God. We only care about what we are in the eyes of man. Right? That's why, as that pastor said, if everyone truly lived what the Bible said, we'd have a completely different world. Mm -hmm. But we won't do it. We just won't, we don't, and it will, for the most part, he goes, it's never going to happen because there are very, very few who get it. And then Paul says here, do these things which is your reasonable service, which really means your acceptable service. God is not asking anything out of the ordinary. What has he given us? Forgiveness, 
salvation. He went to the cross for our sins so we don't have to. We're going to live eternity, eternally with God. Uh, God is on in earth. He is our friend, our father, our comforter. Uh, he is the one who has given us a new life, a new beginning. And God is saying, oh, by the way, this is the one thing I ask of you. Oh, I, that's, I'm not doing that. It's unacceptable. Too hard. It's too hard, God. Paul moves on, and he actually, you know, with Paul, always remember Paul was probably one of the most learned yeah. people in the Bible. Harsh, harsh. Okay, very brilliant man, highly educated, of the education of, I think he was taught under Gamaliel, yeah. okay, one of the greatest you know, uh, Hebrew teachers there. Paul was massively educated, well-versed, great speaker. So when he would speak, obviously under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he, he throws out this first point, okay? And then he tells us really the dangers and why it's going to be hard to do it. Verse 2, be not conformed to this world. Why does he say it? Because the world is conforming you to that. Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing every day. How do we know that? Because every style that we follow, people think, I'm so individual. <laughs> you know, I, oh, I often used to, to, to think, and even back then, when I was in high school, you know, I was really, really cool uh, in my eyes. And I thought I was being an individual because I looked like everyone else. I grew my hair like everyone else. I dressed cool. But was I really being an individual? No, you know what an individual would have been? Going to school in a suit and a tie. That would have stood out. And I, I feel like telling all these young woke people, you want to be, I want to be, oh, I want to be unique and different. Then be like no one else and dress, well, normal. Okay? You want to stand out? That'll blow your friends' minds. Okay? Because we are being conformed. No, the world doesn't tell me what to do. Yes, they do. Every single day, and you capitulate all the time. We all do. As, as Elder John always says, we let the narrative of the world become our narrative. And that's just the way it is. And Paul knows it, God knows it, and he warns us. Don't be conformed to this world because they are conforming you. But what does he say? Well, what's the flip side? What do I do? Be transformed. From what? From what the world is. And when the Bible says the world, what's the world? Everyone who's an unbeliever. Everyone who's not a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, they are the world. And they easily, I mean, do we have to really force the world to conform to the world? No, they do it easily. Because who wants to be wearing the wrong jeans or the wrong shoes or the wrong hairstyle in the wrong time? No, you, I'm not going out like that. That's not what they're wearing today. I've got to wear what everyone's wearing today because I've got to be conformed. But the problem is the Christians, the church, we do the same darn thing. We don't say, what would God have me do? What would God have me look like? How would God have me live? No, we say, well, let me put my finger up in the air. Uh, this pastor again from that book that, uh, that I uh, read. Uh, and I'm reading it again with my wife. We're reading through it because it just every morning we read another part of it. It's just so crazy. He goes, something happened in the church. Every church has based on what their church is like, yeah. not by what the Bible says, mm -hmm. but by what the church down the road is doing. Oh, Joe's doing that now, huh? Okay, everybody, we're going to do what Joe's doing. Why? Well, because Joe's doing it and it's working. Yeah. And Joe did it because Bob was doing it and it's working at his church. So that's what we'll do. We'll conform to the world. And people, the church was never meant to make the world feel comfortable. Yeah. See, that, that seeker-friendly church thing. No, what happens when you compromise? 
Don't we see that in our world? What happens? Who does the compromising? We do. Does the world compromise anything? Oh, you're a Christian, I'm gonna compromise for you. I don't want to offend you. No, they have no problems offending us. They got, I mean, I, I can't even do it there, but that dude, they got the satanic thing at the, you know, they get rid of the, uh, the, uh, the manger scenes and put up a thing of, of Satan on, just, just, because we don't want to offend them, but offending Christians, wide open season, okay? And that's a problem, and that's what's happened. And as this, as, his pers as this pastor said, he goes, we became so concerned about making everyone feel I'm welcome. And there's nothing wrong with letting people feel welcome. I want people to feel welcome. But in order to do that, we wanted to make everything make them feel, even when it came to the reading of the word. Okay? Oh boy, they're not gonna. So we got a couple of people at this age, that age, there. If I read this, they're not gonna like it. If I read that, she's not gonna like it. If I read that, he's not gonna like it. You know what? I think we'll just take one page. We'll just have a one page Bible. And I will put in it, and I will take all the up verses that make everyone feel good about themselves. And that's what we'll do, and that's what's been done. And that's why we're not holy and we're not acceptable unto the Lord. Isn't that an amazing thing? The church today is not acceptable to the Lord. And we think we are. We're learning that in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 on our Wednesday night Bible study. So he says, but be transformed. Well, how am I to be transformed, God? Do I go into like a booth and push a button and it spins me around and I come out? No, he tells us. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of my mind. That means my mind needs to be renewed. Isn't that what it means? It means my mind is thinking and processing things in the wrong way. That's why people, when you come to Christ and you become a Christian, you, you have a rebirth. Well, you know what that means? You have to start all over again. You have to relearn how to deal with every situation. Because, you know, in, gee, in my old life, if situation A happened, my, re my reply was, pop you in the face. So, I don't think that's what God would want me to do. I now have to relearn how I deal with someone who has done, done me wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's not the way that the world says, is it? Right? Read by the renewing of your mind. Well, to what end? That ye may prove, you and I may prove, what is that good and acceptable, there it is again, it is, Paul uses that twice, verse 1 and verse 2, acceptable to who? God. Acceptable to God. And perfect, meaning there's no gray areas. God doesn't have gray areas. He doesn't say, don't do this unless you're in a situation which you really have to and you really got to lie and you re then, then do whatever you got to do to make it. No. There is no clause to get out of thou shalt not lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what if? Yeah, we always come up, but God, but what if? You know? God certainly wouldn't, <laughs> certainly wouldn't want me to tell the truth about everything. What if my wife asks, well, somebody asks, hey, how do you like my new haircut? And you didn't like it. Well, it'd probably be best to keep your mouth shut. That's the way out of it. Because God says, that's a lie. If you say, you know, you look wonderful. I love it. What's that movie? Oh, it's such a funny movie. Some parts are not good. But oh, it was a movie with Jim uh, Carrey. Liar, liar. Yeah, yeah, liar, liar. liar. It's a great movie because it proves a point. Yeah. Remember the little boy, his father yeah. is a lawyer. Yeah. And he, he prays, he prays, he makes a wish. <laughs> because his father is always lying to him about when they're going to do stuff together. Because yeah. one day, let my father not lie. 
And for that one day, Jim Gary as a lawyer, he can't lie. And, and it proves how many times we lie throughout the day. And his, this one receptionist, she walks out, her hair is a little crazy. She goes, what do you think about my new hair? And he, and he, had, he can't say, oh, it looks wonderful. He said, you look like a deranged porcupine or whatever. And he's like, oh. And you can't believe he can't get away from it. So God is, is you know, saying, you know, if you can't say anything nice, yes, then don't say anything, maybe. You know? Pastor. Yes. I had somebody ask me something, and I, I said to them, ask me no questions, I'll tell you. No, yes. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, let people think upon that. That's right. You don't have to really, yes. you know. That's right. Uh, it's, it's like when uh, when people, and this is a good, people always ask me, how are you doing? How many times do we lie a day? Oh, fine. Doing okay. When it's a lie, because, well, you really want to know? And that's another thing. Do people really want to know how you're doing when they ask you how you're doing? No. You want to know how I'm doing? Let's sit down. You got about an hour and a half? I will tell you how I'm doing. No, I really didn't want to know. That's the truth. Okay? That's why my thing is, how you doing? Well, life is good. I mean, life is hard. God, God is, good. is good. So you get an idea. Okay? That's where I'm going with this. Okay? It's like when you get pulled over for speeding. The cop doesn't want to hear about why you're speeding. Yeah. You broke the law. Yeah. That's the same thing. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a part in that movie too. In that movie, Liar Liar, when when he when his secretary gets a phone call from one of his clients who who keeps on breaking the law and and getting into and he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm in I'm in trouble again. And he goes, Stop breaking the law. And, and he hangs up. And it's like over, he gets pulled over and he tells the cop every single thing. That yes, he does. yes. He gets pulled over by the police officer and and the cop goes. Do you know why I pulled you over? Yes, I failed to yield at this corner. I went through a stop sign. And it's like, and plus I have a, a glove compartment filled of unpaid parking tickets. <laughs> you know, it sounds silly to us, but imagine if everyone was truly holy and imagine if politicians actually told the truth, right? But you know that there's there's actually a hidden message in there too because there's a sacrifice in that from telling the truth he lost his Mercedes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he doesn't want to lose his Mercedes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, and that that's why he comes to the to the, remember when he's in the uh, he had he's trying to get his car back and it's scratched up and he goes look what happened to my car and he goes well sue me and he goes and he goes you know what. If I'm going to sue this guy, I'm going to have to take off a day of work, go to court, spend all this money, do all this stuff. I'm not going to win, and I wasted my day, so what do I got to do? This. I'm not going to say what he said, but I'm just going to have to suck it up and move on because it's not worth it. You know? I don't know how I'm getting off on this tangent here, people. Got a lot of purging going on here. So do what that is good and acceptable and perfect. Here it is, will of God. Boy, that's our problem. We really don't care about the will of God. If I'm honest about me, at the end of the day, I want my will to be done. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. But today, it's my kingdom come, my will be done. And if you're really, really honest, and I've, you know, I've been going through a little thing, and I've been talking to God about it, <coughs> and, you know, I hate when God asks you these questions, because I really struggle with the answer. Because I really, you know, in that inner silent voice, See, God, I really want this taken care of. I really want this fixed. And God says, but what if the answer is no? Yeah. What if I say, no, my grace is sufficient for you? Are you okay with that? I, and, God, and it's almost like God saying, I just want to know. Would you still love me? Would you still trust me? Would you be happy? And I'm like, oh, wow. That's hard, God. Yeah. To say, God, please heal this. But if you don't, it's okay. And, and I kept on coming up to those scriptures as Jesus is in the garden. 
saying, Lord, I don't want to accept this cup that's come and handed my way. I don't want to go to the cross. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine. Do you know how hard it is to do that? And I've been really pondering and going, wow, God, I mean, for days going, why can't I answer? Because I know it. If I just say it, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. God, I want your will be done. I'll be fine no matter what you do because you're great. But I, I can't do it because it's going to be a God. So that's not true. That's a lie. Are you at the point? Now, it doesn't mean that God is not going to do what you ask him. Let your request be made known unto God, okay, who is a good father and who give you good things. But to truly say it and go, on, but what if I had to? Would I be happy that way, not getting what I want? I'm still wrestling with it. That was my daily prayer for the past year. Yeah? Every morning, I sat there and I prayed for a resolution to my law, my lawsuit. Yeah. And I always, did, I always said, you know, to God, it's your will. However yeah. you see this turning out, it's your will that I need to be fulfilled here. Mm -hmm. And I always question myself afterwards, do I really mean it? Yeah, do you really it's, mean it's it? And it's a hard thing. And that's why, you know, many times God asks us these, you know, rhetorical questions, not because he wants an answer, but because he wants us to think about it. Okay, because ultimately trusting in God is trusting in God ultimately. And when we come right down to it, it's like, wow, yeah. that is hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What if God says, in order for me, you've been praying for this child or that child or this or that. In order for me to bring that person to the Lord... What if I had to do something really bad in your life to bring them to this point? You had to lose an arm or whatever. Some, you had to get cancer so they can open up their eyes and find the gospel. Ooh. Well, you say you love them. That's another thing. You know, we say we love everyone. God says, no, you don't. Because, you know, it's really one of those things, people. If we really cared about everyone's salvation and them spending eternity in hell, we would be out there begging people, pleading them to come to Christ. Mm -hmm. But we don't because I haven't got much time and I really got to go. I got a meeting at Starbucks, God. This person here that I met, yeah, they're going to spend eternity in hell, but they did a sale. I don't want to miss the sale. Praise God, and I, and, I, and I know this is hard stuff, and that's a fight from that pastor's book that I read, 12 Steps on How to Fit, Destroy Your Church. Tell them the truth about Jesus Christ in the Bible. All of it. They will all leave until nothing's left. Mm -hmm. And it's true. So we don't tell the truth. We keep the church filled, and everyone's happy but God. And he says, you know what? And he, and he goes, you know what got me through? And he had some times he was very bitter, very angry. And I was like, wow, this guy lives my life. You know, when he work and study and two people show up, yet everyone else is at Bob's picnic party at the beach on Facebook. Hey! You know, but not at the study. He goes, many times he goes, at the end of the day, everyone is going to stand before the Lord. They give an answer for everything they've done. And I've got to rest on that. Because I want to stand to see the outcome. I want to get justification. I want retribution. And God says, no, that's not for you. And if you got to preach, I think his church ended up with nine people at the end. And the church actually disbanded. He left, no one cared, and that was the end of it. And it's an interesting thing. And it's, an, and it's a guy who did an experiment to prove a point that people don't really want the truth about anything. They don't want the truth. So, back here, transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, 
not to think of himself more highly than he ought to. Bango! Paul hits it again. Well, what's the problem here? Well, this whole thing in a nutshell is we think more of ourselves than we think we do. I was talking to a, a friend of mine, a great Christian brother, and sharing some things that I'm battling with. And, uh, and he goes, you know, he goes, you got a lot of pride in you. He's a good, a good brother that tells you what it's like. I said, no, I am the humblest pastor in the world. Ask anybody in my church. But he really made me think of something. And by the time I was done, he gave me a great book uh, called Humility by Andrew Murray. And I'm reading it right now. And you know what? If we listen, people, God will bless you. Because I've been reading it, and it was like, wow, I am not a humble person. I do have a lot of pride issues. Wow. And I, I just texted the brother last night. I said, you know what? I'm reading this book he gave me. I said, it's one of those wow, 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 wow. I said, I never saw this. Praise God, he is revealing it to me. And people, we have a choice to say, who do you think you are telling me? But he didn't tell me in, 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 in anger. He told me in love because I see you struggling. He goes, you know, I see some pride in you. And I was like, no, there's no pride in me. I am the humble pastor, okay? We need to accept that we all think of ourselves a lot higher than we ought to. And you know, and this is a flip side of uh, Timothy Keller uh, wrote a book, um, um, I forgot the name of it, it's a great book, but he talks about, it's on a similar note, well, if we're not supposed to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, so should we think about ourselves less than we ought to? And that's the, and, and this is kind of the, it's, it's not a conundrum, mm -hmm. it's an understanding. You have two choices. Yeah. He goes, you know, everything comes down to ego. We don't use that word anymore. Mm -hmm. But ego, it's not your feelings that were hurt. You know what was hurt? Before your I, ego. Yeah. Your ego. And, and there's only three types of egos. There's an overinflated ego. There's an underinflated ego. And there's a properly inflated ego. And I'm like, wow. He goes and he, and he used an example of a football. If you have a football and you put too much air in it, it gets distorted. That's when you think too highly of yourself. If you have no air in the football, it's all you ever see a deflated football, it's all deformed. He goes, both are wrong. Well, what's the answer? A properly inflated football. Neither overinflated nor underinflated. It's not thinking too much about yourself or too little about yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And that was like, I don't, I don't know if you guys got that. Mm -hmm. Did you get it? Mm -hmm. It's not thinking about how great I am or how horrible I am. It's just not thinking about you. That's our problem. All day long we think about how do they look at me on this? Did the people like me here? Did they like me there? I feel bad. I feel good. I feel better than them. I feel less than them. Stop thinking about you. People, we think about us more than anything else. Or think about it. Thinking about us all day long or thinking about God. Who wins? Gee, my hair doesn't look good today. I don't know if I like this jacket. That news report really offends me. It's, it's all day long we think about, how am I feeling? Do I have a pain here? What's up in my ear? It could be a brain tumor. All day long we're constantly thinking about us. Mm -hmm. And as Timothy Keller said, you know, because over the years it was always been, and it's interesting, the psychological world over the years, years ago, was the problem for mankind was this. Okay, we had too high self-esteem, yeah. too high self-esteem. But he goes, now the world has changed that everyone's problem is that they have too low self-esteem. He goes, bunch of baloney, bunch of baloney. 
No, because what do we try to do to fix those who have a low self-esteem? We tell the murderer, the pervert, the nut, no, you're fine just the way you are. Don't think, no, if you did something bad, feel bad about it. That's what we stop doing. Well, I don't want to, I have somebody, uh, in fact, somebody in church here, they're, they're uh, a uh, family member is a high school teacher, and I was asking them, uh, are you, you know, do you, still, you must be cool, I've always, you know, taken the red pen and marking failed or anything, oh, we can't use red pens anymore. Yeah. Can't fail people, can't do this, we have to use a green pen, because the red makes them feel bad about themselves. And that's why all this equality, everyone's going to be the same, everyone gets a trophy. Why? Because, yeah. well, their problem is low self-esteem. No, the problem is you didn't make the cut in the team because you can't throw the ball for, far enough. That means you failed. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, but you can't do that. People, we all, this whole thing, you can do anything you put your mind to. No, you can't. I can't fly, right? My mom says I can do anything when I grow up. I can be anybody. No, you can't. I can never be a brain surgeon. Please don't ask me for brain surgery. Okay? I'm not that smart. And no matter how much schooling I went to, I would never be able to be a brain surgeon. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to pick up on this next time I fill in, and one day we'll get through the rest of these scriptures. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, the problems are many. The solution is simple. But the will to apply the solution is just not there. Help us, Lord, in a world of insanity, in a world of thinking about me all day long. Father, let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what is good, not about me, but about you. That we may prove what is acceptable, not to the world and everyone else, but acceptable to you. That we may prove what is perfect, not in our eyes, but in your eyes. And more importantly, Father, that we may prove and live out the will of God. Your will, not mine. Lord, you wouldn't tell us to do it if it wasn't possible. We can, but the fact is, and I know in my life, it's just too hard and I'm too tired. And I got enough just trying to get through the day. But maybe my problem is, and all of our problem is, the reason why we're just so tired and we can't get through the day is because we haven't actually said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done in every area of my life, no matter what the cost. If you tell me I need to fly over to Israel right now, go on the front lines and fight in the war, well, that's a little inconvenient for me. But what if you told us, would we do it? Probably not. I, w I won't even drive into New York City, Lord. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be flying, flying to the front lines of Gaza there, Lord. Uh, help us, Lord. And you will. You look for a willing heart that says, Here I am, Lord. Send me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.